Welcome back to the 99, where we are focused on brewing a better competitive commander. I'm your host, Patrick Marlat, and today I'll be discussing a brand new list featuring a legendary that just came out of Commander Legends. I think that might be the only Commander Legends card in this particular list, but I want to preface this by stating if you've ever watched any one of my deck techs, you'll know that I'm not interested in brewing whatever is considered top tier or the best of. I'm interested in challenging myself and in challenging the status quo. So instead of building a general turbo list that would win on turn one, two, or three, I've devised a turbo list that wins on turn 10, 11, or 12. Because the star of this particular list happens to be one of my favorite cards in Rakdos, Sire of Insanity. And Sire of Insanity reads for four generic, one black and one red, creature demon, six four body. At the beginning of each end step, each player discards his or her hand. That's right, this turbo list is looking to push that out. But before I get into the deck's logistics, I wanna let you all know that if you enjoy the content I provide on this channel, the best way to help support it is via Patreon. And there is a link in the description with all the details as to how a Patreon membership can benefit you, uh, but to <laughs> name just a few. Uh, we do play pickup games with our Patreon members via Discord for voice over on Cockatrice. We do this twice or three times a month, as often as we can. And of course, our Brew Crew members get to have their opinions voiced at the end of each video during our monthly topic and the monthly topic for november is should casual and competitive have separate ban lists and we've gotten a lot of interesting answers on this monthly topic over on patreon and of course in the comment section here but i would love to know your thoughts are you for and or against separate ban lists and if you'd like to get my opinion on this i did a video last month that featured this very question as the topic of discussion. Now, let's jump into this video, starting with the steps to winning this game. How do you win when you are hellbent? And if you want to follow along with me, I'm actually following my primer over on Moxfield. Not my favorite service, but the one I use. It has so many hiccups and so many ads now. Moxfield, reach out to me. Do I need a pro membership? What the hell's going on? What's going on with your service? At any rate, Still one of the best places to put up a written primer, and that's where you'll find my written primer for this particular deck list. So if you want to look at the entire list, and of course my thoughts written out, you can follow along with me over there. But you're going to try to find a starting hand that enables a turn one Sire of an Insanity, and we'll go over the three methods of accomplishing that. And of course, once you've placed Sire of Insanity out, sometimes turn one, sometimes turn two, and if push comes to shove, turn three. In every game I've tested this list, I've gotten Sire of Insanity out at least by turn three, even with opposition. After which, you will proceed to outvalue your opponents. So again, Sire of Insanity at the end of each uh, player's turn, uh, we all discount, uh, discard our hands down to, to nothing, right? So how do you win the game after you've accomplished this? Well, like many a turbo list, we're utilizing rituals, fast mana, general ramp to push out a plan or strategy. Generally, a lot of lists will turbo ad nauseum, right? So the concept there is to make five black mana, it doesn't need to be black, but five mana, two of which is black, to be able to cast the instant speed ad nauseum. Uh, and I'll put it on the screen now, you should all know what ad nauseum does, but basically you draw uh, almost all the way through your list until you have the core cards to play out a win. Generally speaking, those lists resolve Thassa's Oracle and Demonic Consultation with fast mana yada 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 that's all fine and well there's other takes on you know turbo builds and they're not all blue however this is a mardu take on a turbo list and while ad nauseum is part of one of our three packages there are actually two others i would encourage you reach for first and the first one utilizes transmogrifiers now i've entitled this dragged out so instead of summoning or using ad nauseum to get Sire of Insanity out, we're going to drag him out of our list. And we'll use cards like Luca, Coppercoat, Outcast, Reality Scramble, or Transmogrify. And I'll go ahead and read off Transmogrify so we all have a basic idea of how these function. For three generic and one red, sorcery speed, exile target creature. That creature's controller reveals cards from the top of their library until they reveal a creature card. That player puts that card onto the battlefield and then shuffles the rest into their library. So very similar to Polymorph in blue, we get to do this in red. And as a matter of fact, there's another card called Divergent Transformations, I believe, that does the same thing, except it does it with two creatures. 
Uh, we're ignoring that for this list. We don't want to give anyone advantage, and oftentimes we don't have two creatures to do that to ourselves. However, what's unique about having Rograk in the command zone with Timma is the fact that we have a zero cost creature that we can transmogrify whenever we choose. Now, Luka and Reality Scramble operate in much the same way, Reality Scramble being the best of these three, and I'll get into why that is later. But don't forget Reality Scramble, because you can exile, or rather put a permanent from the field on the bottom of your library, a permanent, and then find one of a similar type. So extremely useful. Now in the breakdown over on Mox Field, I go over all the rituals, fast mana and ramp that is in this list to accomplish this task. But to make this all easier for you, I'm just gonna go over a handful of examples as to how this works. And then you can piece together how to get a turn one sire from there. You should be able to extrapolate how to do that by looking at your hand and obviously knowing what all the rituals ramp and fast mana are in this list. So for our first example, I'm gonna go ahead and use Luka Copper Coat Outcast. So if you have Rograk out, and this combo requires at least three cards in hand, you can use Mana Crypt, assuming that you have a land of the relevant color. In this instance, let's just say it's a bad land. Mana Crypt, Seething Song, Seeding Song for two generic, one red, instant speed, add five red to your mana pool, and Luka Copper Coat Outcast, we can go ahead and get Sire of Insanity. So Luka reads for three generic and double red, legendary planeswalker Luka, five loyalty counters. And I'm just gonna read off the negative two because it is the only one that matters. Exile target creature you control, then reveal cards from the top of your library until you reveal a creature card with higher converted mana cost. Put that card onto the battlefield and the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. So if we're doing our math right, we've cast Rograk, we have a Badlands, we cast a Mana Crypt, we tap the Badlands and the Mana Crypt for Seething Song, that's five red mana, that's more than enough to cast Luka. As a matter of fact, it's exactly enough to cast Luka. And the creature we're grabbing has a much higher converted mana cost than Rograk, son of Rogha, right? So once we've done that, at the end of this turn, everyone will be hellbent. So obviously, the more goodies you have in your hand to play out, the better. And before we go any further and I do any more examples, I want you to know that if you can have more advantage on the field by waiting until turn two, that is to say more artifacts like Sensei's Divining Top, something that's gonna give you benefit in the long term during a hellbent game, or provide you with protection while you're going to cast said transmogrifier, then sometimes it's advisable to wait until turn two. But generally speaking, if you're on the play especially, pushing a turn one Sire of Insanity is key. It Just put it on the field. If you're playing first and you are able to do that, just do that. Even if it means discarding some utility that you really want to have on the field, don't worry about it. You're gonna be in a much better spot than anyone else, trust me. And that's all because of Timna. Now, let's go ahead and read off another example here. Uh, this time around, we'll use Reality Scramble, and I'll get into why Reality Scramble is so good. So, again, assuming you have a land of the color necessary, and all these instances with transmogrifiers, it's going to be red. You need a mountain. But Rograk, son of Ragra, <laughs> Ragha, 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 Rite of Flame, right? So for one red, sorcery speed, add two red, then add an additional red for each card named Rite of Flame in your graveyard. Never going to happen. Then you can cast Infernal Plunge, right? So for one red sorcery speed as an additional cost to cast this spell, a sacrifice a creature, then you add three red to your mana pool. If you have Jeweled Lotus, a new favorite, you can go ahead, use that, and recast Rograk, right? So if we're doing our math here, we've used one, let's say Badlands again, Badlands for uh, Rite of Flame, then we've used one of that red to go ahead and sacrifice Rograk, right? So now we have one red, four red, and with that, we can cast Reality Scramble after we've placed Rograk back on the field with Jeweled Lotus. So essentially, we're using uh, the Sacrifice spell Infernal Plunge uh, as a way of converting Jeweled Lotus mana, right? We have one mana left with Jeweled Lotus. Don't worry about that. We're going to go ahead and cast Reality Scramble now. So this card, extremely good for the list on multiple levels, but for two generic, double red, sorcery speed, put target permanent you own on the bottom of your library. Reveal cards from the top of your library until you reveal a card that shares a card type with that permanent. Put that card onto the battlefield and the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. This card also has retrace. So you may cast this card from your graveyard, but discarding a land card in addition to paying its mana cost. So if you happen to fail, you can continually do this. 
And what's important to note is that permanent doesn't get put at the bottom of your library until this begins to resolve. So if you happen to fail, Rograk is still there. You can continue to do this turn after turn. And I've actually pushed out Reality Scramble twice, like turn one and then turn two, to insist on the Sire coming out. And again, if you're looking at the list, Sire of Insanity is the only creature in our deck. That's how this functions at its highest. But what's important about Reality Scramble, beyond the fact it has retrace, is the fact that it says permanent. So if we used Luca Copper Coat Outcast to go ahead and drop our Sire of Insanity, we have another Planeswalker in this list that's acting as a finisher for the deck. And we can use Reality Scramble to put Luca at the bottom of our list and find that Planeswalker instead. Now I'll get to her, spoiler alert, it's a girl, at the end of this video. But Reality Scramble, don't sleep on it. It's amazing. Uh, now I'm not going to go over the final example here. It uses Transmogrify in much the same way that Luca and Reality Scramble have accomplished this task. Of course, if you want to look over all of my examples, you can just follow along on the primer. So essentially the number one way I recommend you get Sire of Insanity out is via one of the Transmogrifiers. It's the cleanest way to accomplish this task and it's very easy to do with all of the red rituals we have in this list. And of course, Things like Mox Amber being enabled, things like Infernal Plunge being enabled because of a zero CMC commander is fantastic. It just makes life so much easier when you have fast mana at your disposal that much quicker by having a zero CMC commander. Again, easily the best commander to come out from Commander Legends. I've mentioned that in my reviews. I'll say so again now. So there are three ways to get Sire out and because we're in black, there are a couple ways to summon Sire out. And by this, I mean reanimating. So our summoning agents include things like Cabal Therapy, Faithless Looting, Reanimate, Tormenting Voice and Tomb Throw a Possibility and Animate Dead. Now I'm not gonna go over all of these, but the core cards here, if Sire happens to be in our hand, the ones that let us discard, obviously. If Sire happens to be in our deck, and I'll start there, Cards like Entomb really help. So if you don't know what Entomb is, it's like the core card to any reanimate strategy. It's one black for instant speed spell, search your library for a card and put that card into your graveyard, then shuffle your library. Now this does not need to be Sire of Insanity. Again, we can get Reality Scramble with this, should we like, right? If we don't have the animate spell, but we can very easily accomplish a Reality Scramble cast then put Reality Scramble in your graveyard. And obviously there's other Entombed targets, but the predominant one is going to be Sire of Insanity. Now the other core part of any reanimator strategy is the spell Reanimate. And if you don't know what this does, it's one black sorcery speed, put target creature card from a graveyard onto the battlefield under your control. You lose life equal to its converted mana cost. Well, boohoo, you lost a little bit of life there. However, you get Sire of Insanity. What's that do? Oh, we're all hellbent now. Again, <laughs> advisable to play as much of your hand as possible before this event occurs, uh, but you're gonna be in a good place after the fact, and we'll talk about the end game after this. And I should state from here on out, the goal of this list, the goal of this list is to make people want to concede and or just give up on playing Magic. That was my goal for this list. It was also to challenge the concept that this game is a turn three format because speed by no means is a measure for competitive commander. The speed at which a game concludes has nothing to do with it, whether a game was competitive or not. I, I hate this misconception. That's what this list challenges. So if we want to get Sire of Insanity out and it's in our hand, the first example I'll go over is very simple. Assuming we have a land on the field with a relevant color, we're summoning Sire of Insanity. Guess what? Swamps are very important in this situation. So if we have a swamp in the battlefield and we cast Dark Ritual. So Dark Ritual, I'll paraphrase, it's black, instant speed, you make three black. Uh, with Dark Ritual, we can cast Cabal Therapy, one of my favorite cards. Cabal Therapy for one black, sorcery speed, name a non-land card that player, target player rather, reveals his or her hand and discards all cards with that name. Should Sire of Insanity be stuck in your hand, remove it, go ahead and discard it. So. Put Sire of Insanity into your graveyard. You have two black floating, cast Reanimate. Well, that was easy, right? Provided you have a means of protecting Sire before the turn rolls out, you're good. Not that many people run Slaughter Pack. Not that, if you're on the play, it's not 
I don't think you need to worry about Sire of Insanity getting killed, unless someone else put their own Rograk down and uses a deadly Rolic or something. It's very unlikely that someone's going to sacrifice their game, casting Slaughter Pact or something stupid, to remove Sire of Insanity. And by no means does it make sense to give your opponents advantage by removing resources from yourself to get an early game removal on Sire of Insanity. It's oftentimes better to, if you're not going to concede, let Sire exist so that you're all in the level playing field. Then obviously the people that were going to abuse their life as a resource, you as the Sire player are attacking. So it's interesting dynamic what happens when Sire hits the battlefield. And I'll talk a little bit more about that before we get into the end game. But another way to get Sire out, if Sire of Insanity is in your deck and you don't have the resources immediately to go off, but you do have a Demonic Tutor in hand, I also happen to have Entomb. So with Rograk, son of Ragra, Raga, I'm butchering that name, a black mana source, so let's just say Swamp, we can use Culling the Weak to sacrifice Rograk, and then we can cast Demonic Tutor. So we have, if you're counting, two black left. Now we can go ahead and grab Reanimate. Well, the four black we just got from Culling the Weak is allowing us to do all of these things. And again, this is gonna require you have at least three of these cards in your hand. That means the other, if you're starting with a hand of seven, the other eight cards, the other five cards rather, can be anything at this point. Hopefully a Mox Amber and a Red Elemental Blast or something to make sure that all of this goes off without a hitch. But again, very easy to find these lines. And there are far, far more than I've actually illustrated here. Again, it's realizing what you need to look for pending the strategy you're playing for. So if we're using transmogrifiers, we want red rituals, things that produce red mana. If we're going to reanimate Sire of Insanity, we're obviously going to want black rituals, black mana sources. Now, and <laughs> speaking of black mana sources, the last play line I want to discuss is utilizing ad nauseum. And you can do this with as few as two or more cards in your hand. And I've gone ahead and just illustrated a handful of examples here and I'll talk through a handful as well but assuming you have ad nauseum in hand and in case you don't know what ad nauseum is did I illustrate it earlier I'll, I'll just I'll I'll let you know what it is now <laughs> for three generic double black one of the most broken cards in magic at least in commander instant speed reveal the top card of your library and put that card into your hand you lose life equal to its converted mana cost you may repeat this process any number of times now People like to say that you need to build for this card to be good. That's bullshit. If I cast this for five and I draw five cards, that's really good. Even if just that, doesn't matter how much life I lost. Let's say I lost 10 life, I drew five cards. Excellent value. If I draw 15 cards, even better. Now, the thing is, this card is extremely good to the point where it's abusable. So if you have a list with a low CMC, a very low mana curve, you can go ahead and draw through a majority of your list to where you can get the solution you need or the solutions to win outright. So just like any turbo list, like any good turbo list, this deck is able to utilize ad nauseum for much the same effect, a turn one Sire of Insanity. So if we have a basic swamp in our hand, and of course ad nauseum we can go ahead and use dark ritual and mana crypt to cast ad nauseum ah uh, you see how that works pretty easy right <sighs> look depending on what you ad nause here and i'm not going to give you all the answers depending on what you ad nause here i like turn one ad nause with 40 life you should be able to find the solutions but it might require you casting multiple tutors to find the right play line to go for and at this point Ad nauseum is going to lead into one of our two uh, previously discussed play lines, and that is reanimating Sire of Insanity and or transmogrifying Sire of Insanity. So just depending on what you have in your hand after the ad nauseum is complete, you'll know what to go for, I hope. And of course, I've illustrated all the cards you need to consider here for you. So again, this is one of the only lists I'll, I'll definitely encourage you to check out the written primer for because there's a lot of cards I'm just not going to discuss. Turbo lists, it just requires you have a knowledge of your own deck to know how it operates and the most efficient play lines to get to, you know, plan A, which is usually some sort of win con. But in this list, it's just Sire of Insanity. Uh, the next way we can cast this is with something like Cabal Ritual. Cabal Ritual, Chrome Mox, and Mana Crypt. So Chrome Mox will need something to exile at this point. And of course, 
this thing, it, it doesn't need to be a black source because Cabal Ritual is going to generate the three, right? So if you do have a swamp on the field, you should be fine. And I should read off Cabal Ritual. It's the same thing as Dark Ritual, but for one generic more. Also, it has a threshold on it. That is to say, if you have seven or more cards in your graveyard, you'll generate five black mana instead. So Cabal Ritual by itself it can actually cast that nauseum mid to late game, which is also very good provided you need to you know go off mid to late game if you somehow failed uh during your first second or third attempt in the early stages of the game uh, this is a great way to get you back on track uh, so i'll go ahead and just stop there with the ad nauseum play lines obviously these are just a handful of examples there's tens to maybe even a hundred ways of combination that can lead to an ad nauseum cast and you know I'm not talking, you know, happy times, Christmas land, you, you happen to hit it. No, there, there are a lot of ways baked into this list to simply cast an Ad Nauseum or simply reanimate Sire of Insanity or simply transmogrify Rograk into Sire of Insanity on turn one here. Because it's just that simple when you have a zero cost creature in the command zone. All right, so you did it. You got Sire of Insanity out on turn one. Your opponent's not compelled to forfeit this game. They want to continue. Now it's important to note from here on out that you are public enemy number one. You are arch enemy at this table. Whether for better or worse, opponents will strictly target you and you should expect that. What's important to note is that this list, because of the nature of its strategy, is a lot, and that is having no creatures outside of Sire Insanity, we have so many slots for removal, stacks, and interaction that just break up the board and we're not even being as offensive as we could be we could add things like ravages of war armageddon to this list things that just shut down our opponents from playing the game of magic at all we don't want to make them that upset but we are going to put their face in the dirt with the rest of this list so the rest of this discussion is going to be about playing a game where you continue from a turn one sire how do you outvalue your opponents like i alluded to earlier we have Rograk, but we also have Timna in the command zone. And more often times than not, when you've assembled that turn one sire or turn two sire, you generally have the resources to simply cast Timna the very next turn. When you do so, you have a 6-4 body swinging that will allow you to draw cards. And I might as well read off Timna the Weaver. I know we all know what she does, but she's on the screen now. One generic, one white, one black, legendary creature, human cleric, 2-2 two -two body, lifelink, just reprinted in Commander Legends. I should state, she's the best legendary from Commander Legends, provided we're including um, reprints. Anyway, at the beginning of your uh, post-combat main phase, you may pay X life, where X is the number of opponents that were dealt combat damage this turn. If you do, draw X cards. The life gain is actually very important here. Again, you will be swung at repeatedly, so you need the life gain. Um, <laughs> Don't neglect that, and sometimes you won't even bother with the draw, provided you have an excellent board state. So Timna is going to help us draw through our list, and what are we looking for at this point to close out the game? What is our end game? Now, like I was saying, we want to take this chance to remove any creatures, artifacts, and everything in between from this point on. So I'm going to go over a handful of cards that seem a little suspect in this list, I'm not going to go over everything I've listed here. I'll, again, I'll encourage you to check out the list for every single piece of removal in totality. But one card I want to mention right off the bat is something that you might have seen in my Anya Falconrath list, and that card is Cut Ribbons. Unlike Anya Falconrath, Cut Ribbons here is almost strictly used as a piece of removal. So for one generic and one red, we are able to zap something for four damage. However, if you were to tilt your head to the right, you'll notice that Cut has an aftermath spell. Both of these are at sorcery, but for X and double black, you can have each opponent lose X life. Now this may seem like an oddity here, but the percentage of creatures, let alone commanders I see, with four defense are high. I see Krom often, I see Kess often, I see Zur often. This strikes down each one of them. So if our opponent manages to build up the land base or build up the artifacts to cast their commander, well anything from four defense down is gonna die to this. And provided that this is in my graveyard, it will act as a finisher. Uh, more on that later, but you don't need infinite mana like you do in Anya Falcon Wrath. As a matter of fact, you just need enough. 
So the next time I want to discuss, if you are in Rakdos, this is an essential, and I'm going to read off the original text, not the eroded version. I'll place it on the screen now. Fire Covenant. This is a must. It, you, I don't care what you're playing. I don't care how proactive you think your list is. This game is in solitaire. Run some removal. Stop complaining at people to remove the collector oof for you. Run Fire Covenant. So for one generic, black and a red, instant speed, Fire Covenant deals X damage divided any way you choose among any number of target creatures where X is equal to the amount of life you pay. Effects that prevent a redirect damage cannot be used to counter this life loss. Or loss of life, rather. Fire Covenant is, is the best, this is the best removal spell. I know people get really giddy over Toxic Deluge because it gets around indestructible, it gets around targeted effects, like things that allow you not to target creatures like Shroud or Hexproof. Well, I gotta tell you, Shroud, Hexproof, Indestructible, not that common in CDH. You don't see that shit at all. Uh, Fire Covenant, on the other hand, this is gonna destroy a majority of the things that are going to mount on a board state that's hellbent. And I mean, dorks that are popping up, commanders that are popping up, anything that can actively be a threat to us. We are gonna continue to push our opponents into the ground with Fire Covenant. This is easily the best piece of removal for this list. I highly recommend you use it here. And again, I don't care what list you're running. If it's in Rakdos, Fire Covenant. Just play Fire Covenant. Now I want to talk about some artifact removal and I'm going to talk about a card I don't generally play but I will advocate for in this list and another card that is king in this list. So for artifacts in general, by force is fantastic. Again, this is a game, we're all hellbent at this point. By force allows you to destroy any artifact ramp your opponents might have gained. So for X and a red, sorcery speed, destroy X target artifacts. And what's beautiful about this is that no one has a hand. There is no fear for recourse when you go to cast this. So put as much mana into X as you want. Uh, if there are, and I, I think the biggest buy force I did was seven. X was seven. Everything was gone. Everything was gone. Outside of my own artifacts, that is. Um, lovely, lovely in this list. And again, in a list that's hellbent. I normally recommend Shattering Spree over this because you make you can replicate Shattering Spree to make multiple copies so that you don't have to fear about any one getting countered in case you needed to take out a few core cards on the board. You can target those things multiple times and or just target them at once and see what happens. By Force, so good in this list. In a world that's hellbent, By Force is great. Now, the next piece of artifact removal I'm gonna discuss, and the one I definitely recommend you shoot for if you have a tutor and want to start removing artifacts, is Shenanigans. Shenanigans. For one generic, one red, sorcery speed, destroy target artifacts, but in the what's more department, it has dredge one. Now, what's that mean? If you would draw a card, you can replace that draw by milling the top card of your library and instead putting shenanigans back into your hand, allowing you to recast the spell over and over again. This is... Can you hear that? That's a guy going to buy every copy of shenanigans he can. I, I wonder if you can hear that. Do it just sound like a crazy person? A loud motorcycle just ran through my neighborhood. Anyways, shenanigans. Excellent piece of removal for this list because when you're top decking, again, if you have Sire of Insanity and Timna out, you're drawing two cards a turn on top of the draw you get for a turn. So you have three cards over your opponent's one card already, pending blockers. And it's likely they're not going to have blockers if you turn one Sire of Insanity. So you can use one of the three cards you're drawing for your turn to grab shenanigans. And it doesn't have to be the first card you draw. It can be one of the cards you draw off of Timna instead. So you can plan out how you manipulate shenanigans as the game goes on. So long as it's in your graveyard, you are in a good place. The best piece of artifact removal in the deck. Trust me, you want it. Now, there are two more cards I want to discuss. These were late additions to the list, but I found that they're hyper beneficial for ensuring that the game goes your way. Now, because we don't use any creatures outside of Rock Rack, Timna, and Sire of Insanity, Torpor Orb is really good. As a matter of fact, it might be one of the best pieces of stacks you could add to this list. So for two generic artifact, creatures entering the battlefield don't cause abilities to trigger. Now there are various forms of this card, but I, if I'm not mistaken, this one from New Phyrexia is the original. Uh, creatures entering the battlefield don't cause abilities to trigger. So Tsukotli Honor Guard White gets a lot of this, um, but this is something that you can slide into any list. And for two generic, that's all the better for us. 
plus it doesn't get in the way of sire. So despite the fact that we can add more of these effects, we don't need more than this. So if you top deck this, you are shutting down any Gilded Drake that might appear, any Thassa's Oracle that might try to happen, any Dockside from helping someone's board state, any Manglehorn from dropping and destroying an artifact. The list is numerous for creatures that enter the battlefield and do something important. Say no. Say no. I really don't need to say too much about that card. You get it's good. If you play CDH, you, <laughs> you get it's good. But you generally don't run it because you want your Dockside to make treasures. I get it. Not on this list. You don't give a shit. Next card I want to talk about, Blood Moon. And this is literally one of the last things I put in this list before finalizing the deck. Two generic, one red, non-basic lands or mountains. Whew. Okay, so I generally don't play against too many monocolored lists. It really depends. When we play with the Patreon crew, I see a lot of monocolored lists and I love that, except for when I try to make Blood Moon useful. <laughs> So kudos to you guys, you're making Blood Moon seem useless. However, generally speaking in mixed pods and or competitive meta, you generally see three to four to five colored lists. And if we're all top decking, even dual colored lists get screwed by Blood Moon. Like if you're just not hitting your basics and all you're hitting are fetches after this is already on the field, if red isn't a part of your color pie, you're, you're gonna hate your life from here on out, unless you top deck Dockside Extortionist, and then maybe, maybe there's a chance. Uh, but you know, you have nothing in your hand to cast anyway, so what are you really doing with that treasure? By force, by force, all the treasures at this point. So we've got a number of means of removing creatures, destroying artifacts, and of course, stopping the board from going off in any meaningful way, uh, provided we decide to continue in the land of Hellbent. But, how do we close out the game at this point? And there are three core cards to do this. Okay, no, I added no more than this because we, again, you typically expect folks to concede. And I mean, that was the intended goal of this list, right? That was my mindset going into this. However, when people do consider continuing, you will shut them down with one of these three cards. And the first one I want to talk about is Chandra Torch of Defiance. So Chandra is the best planeswalker in red in and just mono red solely red best planeswalker i don't know if that's a hot take but for two generic double red legendary planeswalker chandra plus she has four abilities plus one i'm gonna read off the relevant ones all of them she comes into play with four loyalty counters plus one exile the top card of your library you may cast that card you have to choose then and there it's not like until the end of turn if you don't cast that card Chandra Torch of Defiance deals two damage to each opponent. Plus one, add two mana, two red mana. Negative three, Chandra Torch of Defiance deals four damage to target creature. Oh, hey, huh. cut ribbons, anyone? Negative seven, you get an emblem with whenever you cast a spell, any spell, this emblem deals five damage to any target. Remember how I mentioned Reality Scramble earlier, how it's important that it says the word permanence? When you decide to Reality Scramble Luca, you grab Chandra Torch of Defiance. Yeah, so you are able to get an additional card, right? So if you've got the Sire, you got the Timna, you got your draw per turn, that's three cards, Chandra Torch of Defiance. You're seeing four cards over your opponent's one card every single turn. If that fails, you do two damage to each opponent. So they went down from, let's just say they're at 40 life for some reason. They all went down to 38 at this point, and it's going to continue to do this. Oh, you know what? I transmogrified my Rograk. Might as well put him back out with that plus two, or plus two red mana. It doesn't really matter because you are going to get to ultimate this thing. Moreover, any other list I've played, Chandra gets to ultimate in this deck because... When you go Hellbent on turn one, if you were able to push this out prior, and sometimes I'll even recommend you wait for a turn two uh, Transmogrify or Reanimate strategy, provided you can get Chandra Torch of Defiance out, because if you can get her out before doing that, oh, everyone is in a bad spot. Because if you use the double red on her to do the reality scramble, right, to get rid of the raw grag, fine sire of insanity, she's at five loyalty. You need to do this two more times. Get her to eight loyalty first before you use her ultimate. I'm talking about it like it's a practical thing. It actually happens when you put her out on turn one or turn two and are capably able, able rather to keep her on the field, you will ultimate. But beyond that, her plus one uh, to do two damage to the board is more than enough. Just giving you card advantage is more than enough. I would say it's 50-50 between that and the add two additional red. 
Excellent finisher for the list. One of my favorite planeswalkers. Easily the best planeswalker in red. Quote me. Okay, so ribbons. I just wanted to re-illustrate the fact that this card is excellent removal, but also ribbons. <laughs> you don't need to go infinite to make this pop off. If you've already started to damage out the board and you've been spreading the love, oftentimes you'll get this everyone down to 25, like the mid 20s. You can begin to whittle away at them with ribbons as well. So if you were able to, it's, it sounds crazy, but it happens because we've used so many rituals. We've used so much of our turn just developing our board state with artifact ramp, um, fast mana, all, all that stuff. You can finale of promise get X to 10, go ahead, copy the rituals, make a shit ton of mana and pour it all into ribbons. And I know this sounds far-fetched. I know it sounds like something that happens infrequently, but I'm telling you, when you're seeing three cards over everyone else's one, uh, you do pull into board states that are more favorable. And that's the whole concept of finishing this, right? It's, it's the end game. Uh, I do want to discuss Finale of Promise actually with you guys, because that is a card that I just illustrated there that is fantastic for this list. I just need to pull it up. It's sorcery speed, two red, X. You may cast up to one target instant or and or up to one target sorcery card from your graveyard, uh, each with a converted mana cost of X or less without paying its mana cost. If a card cast this way, it would be put into your graveyard this turn, exile instead. Most importantly, if X is 10 or more, copy those spells twice. You may choose new targets for the copy and you can sack these copies however you choose. So. Like I was saying there, generally speaking, if Cut Ribbons is in your graveyard, you're just gonna target your rituals. You're gonna, I'm gonna say, <laughs> Jessica's will wouldn't be good here, but we do have a Rite of Flame for ramp, right? We can go ahead and manipulate spells. Um, we can use our Culling the Week here, uh, coupled with any other ritual that is at sorcery speed, right? So even if it's just like Infernal Plunge and Seething Song, it doesn't matter. Um, you get copies for that. Right, and if the copies had an additional, rather the initial cast had an additional cost, you do need to pay that. But the copies don't care. So if I did do Infernal Plunge and X was over ten from Finale of Promise, I just need to sacrifice that one thing once, and I get to copy this spell twice. So I get to make nine red mana after the fact. Again, all of this sounds really far fetched, but I've closed out games with Finale of Promise. It is a very good card for the list, and something I didn't actually add uh, in my Ridden Primer here. And shame on me because. It deserves mention. Uh, so a little bit of mention there. Cut ribbons, yes. You can fill X up very easily. It is a finisher for the deck. Again, tr test the list out. When you go to turn 12, you'll see what I mean. Luminarch Ascension. <sighs> okay, so Luminarch Ascension is something that I personally mess up with often. And I'll tell you the secret to Luminarch Ascension uh, after explaining it to you. So for one generic, one white enchantment, at the beginning of each opponent's end step, if you didn't lose life this turn, you may put a quest counter on Luminarch Ascension. Uh, generally speaking, this means that they need to swing at you, right? So if you have a 6-4 body on the field and you have Luminarch Ascension, and I mean Sire of Insanity, just leave him untapped, right? So for one generic, one white, put a 4-4 white angel creature token with flying onto the battlefield. Activate this ability only if Luminarch Ascension has four or more counters on it. So one, two, three, four. Leading into that setup, go ahead and save all your mana. And from here on out, you might have Timna down, you might have Sire of Insanity. Sure, you're drawing a lot of cards. You want to have the most advantage. Unless the cards you're casting are ramp, like artifact mana, pieces of ramp, uh, I don't recommend you cast spells on your turn. I recommend you save all of your mana to pump out as many angels as you can, because nothing is gonna give you more advantage than paying two CMC off turn to generate a four, four body that can start to swing at people. And this is where I mess up a lot of the times. I feel like I don't leverage Luminarch Ascension enough and I've gotten this card to pop off multiple times in this list. And I find that I am too aggressively playing the hands I get from Timna, my Captain's Claws, and we'll get to that in a second. Uh, Raw Grack, equipped with Captain's Claws, Sire of Insanity. I feel like I, I get so much draw that I want to utilize the hands I see, but everything that this deck is building towards, uh, nothing tops Luminarch Ascension. This, this is the finisher, the true finisher for the list. So if you want to end the game quickly, save your mana for Luminarch Ascension. Don't make mistakes like me, okay?
Now, the last card I want to talk about, because there are a few odds and ends in this list. I know some cards are going to stick out like sore thumbs. This is a very odd list to begin with, so I don't blame you for looking at it and not understanding where some of these card choices come from. But do note that I, I test everything. Name a card in the comment section down below, and I'll let you know I've tested it. Captain's Claws. Why is this card in the list? I can already hear you saying it. I've been asked it multiple times. If you accomplish a turn one Sire of Insanity, sometimes, and you don't know what your board state's gonna look like after the fact, right? It's very easy, however, to cast a spell for two generic. So for two generic artifact equipment, equipped creature gets plus one, plus zero. Equipped creature attack, when equipped creature attacks, put a one, one core ally creature token onto the battlefield tapped in attacking. Equip cost of one. I don't know where I'll end up after I get the Sire of Insanity down. Maybe all I did was play a bunch of rituals, right? But for some, I was able to drop at least enough mana to generate two. So if I were to top deck this, right? Let's just say I had my Mox Diamond and my Badlands again. If I top deck this, I feel great because I can go ahead, tap that, tap out and play Claws, uh, Captain's Claws. Next turn, I can go ahead and equip the Captain's Claws or better yet, if I'm able to cast Timna, I'll go ahead and cast Timna. Captain's Claws are going to go onto Timna, should she be out. If Timna is not out, put Captain's Claws onto Sire of Insanity. Why this is in the list, when you go to swing, you are generating a creature tapped and attacking for you, and you can choose where that creature goes. So if Timna happens to be out, Sire of Insanity, Timna, and a core ally at you. I now draw three cards. That's already good value. I'm drawing three cards instead of the two I would generally get from them. But the plus one plus O oh on top of this makes sure that our Rograk just isn't a useless creature anymore because more often times than not, Rograk is just fodder for a sack outlet. And I mean, spells like Diabolic Intent, I mean, Skull Clamp, anything that allows me to sacrifice a creature for value, I generally just use Rograk for that from the rest of the game on. Generally not a great card after Sire has come out. With Captain's Claws, however, Rograk becomes a 1-1 with First Strike, Menace, and whatever, Trample. Now I can swing with Rograk, guarantee I get in on someone, right? So the person I swing with Rograk uh, at is gonna have like the one blocker and I'll get past that one blocker because of Menace. The core ally is gonna go on my friend over here using Ad Nauseam or trying to use Ad Nauseam and then I'll swing Sire at that same person and Timna over here to gain life. I will begin to mount multiple core allies as the turns go on and that damage adds up one damage to two damage that's three damage in total you get the idea you're going to snowball out core allies the longer this stays on the battlefield right but what's great about this i mentioned skull clamp also in the list skull clamp can utilize those for even more draw you can use this for your infernal plunge you can use this for your calling the weak any spell that says ash additional cost sacrifice a creature you're getting creatures that are outside of your commanders and Sire of Insanity to do things with, right? And you don't want to sacrifice an angel for calling the weak. I don't know what you're casting at this instance, but trust me, a core ally instead is much better. The fact that you're able to, for such a low CMC, generate bodies that add board presence to your board for protection for your Chandra, protection for your Luka, protection for your own health is great. Generally speaking, once I've generated a bunch of core allies, I leave a few up. If I'm not pulling into cards that allow me to kill the board, I leave a few up. If you still don't feel inclined, go ahead and remove it. And that's really what's great about any of the list I showcase on this show. Uh, I'm not going to say that this is the only way you can do this, but I do believe that this is a better way. So if you wanted to test Rograk and Timna in their best form, summoning the Sire, to play, well then this might be the list for you. Again, things to note, you are arch enemy from here on out. Your friends may not like you after they play you with this list multiple times. And games will go past turn three. That's my favorite part about this deck. Games generally conclude on average maybe around 45 to 60 minutes in, right? They do take a while longer, but if everyone wants to sink their teeth into a game that's hellbent, the great equalizer, everyone top decking for a solution to play Magic, well then this is a fun list to set that up. I, I gotta say, I, I've maybe played 12 games with this particular list, right? So I, I've tested it multiple times, I've played 12 full-fledged games with this list. 
if not more. Uh, there was never a game where I didn't get Sire of Insanity out. 100% success rate. That's that's pretty good. <laughs> Obviously in time, someone's gonna come at me aggressively enough and win with Thassa's Oracle or some bullshit, and that's cool. But I'm trying to do something completely opposite. And if you wanna do something completely opposite, I highly recommend trying this list out. It is a fun time in for you, in my opinion. I, I generally find this a fun list. And if you're one of my Patreon members who played me with this list, let, let me know in the comment section how you felt about it. Um, I know we have some mixed motions. I think a majority of us enjoyed our time regardless. Um, but you, you all are good company, that's why. And speaking of, gang, if you want to help support this channel, help me do the things I do on this channel, that means the Brew Wars episodes, the deck text, the reviews, all that good good, the best way to do so is to join our Patreon. And of course, there are details in the description down below. But at the end of each of these videos, I like to thank a lucky random patron. And that patron today is Sam Brown. Sam, thank you for being a brew baby. You are among the best. And for his thoughts on the monthly topic, I'll be speaking for brew crew member Spaceman MTG. When answering this question, I think there are some assumptions that first must be corrected about casual and competitive EDH. Foremost, the idea that there's a difference between CDH and EDH. I believe that many players see a difference between EDH and CDH because of the misnomer that has been attached to CDH. The abbreviation, of course, means competitive Elder Dragon Highlander. At its heart, EDH is a casual format, regardless of the level of play. In other words, there is no competitive EDH. There is just EDH. Based on this fact, the RC's lack of interest in creating separate ban lists for competitive play is completely justifiable and informs my answer to this question. Which simply put is no. Casual and competitive should not have separate ban lists. Why should the RC curate a competitive ban list for a format that is casual and has always been? Another assumption in question is the idea that the ban list exists to maintain a meta or to balance the format. This is simply not true. The ban list exists to preserve the philosophical concept of fun that the RC has designed the ban list around. Flash was not banned because of power level, but because its negative impact on the fun of the format for players playing at its top end. To conclude, a separate ban list is not needed for top end EDH. And that will do it for this video. I hope you enjoyed this deck tech. And again, guys, if you wanna see these lists before they come out, the best way to do so is to be a member of the Patreon. It doesn't matter what tier you're in. Me and the crew like to play pickup games with voice on Discord and games over on Cockatrice. So if you wanna see these lists before they ever come out, test your might against the hellbent king, Sire of Insanity, well then joining the Patreon is the best and only way to do so. Again, my name is Patrick Marlette, and happy brewing, babies.